The jury find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty. Well, we didn't see that coming. Wait, maybe one of us did. The person who helped shape the jury that decided Kyle Rittenhouse won't be going to prison. Joellen Demetrius sure knows how to pick him, and she's done it many times before. She is my guest tonight on Banfield. Plus, fresh from a win in the national spotlight, Kyle's lawyer, Mark Richards, joins me live as well. And split-second decisions that can save lives or cost police their careers. The 1506 half fire step it up. He's still in there. Come and get him out. The view from behind the shield on policing in America. And then we'll kick off the weekend with a little bit of levity. The news we can't really believe even made the news from Comedy Club Karen to the zany lady at the zoo. What is going on here? It's the lighter side and it's coming up on Banfield. Hello and welcome to Banfield. For the first time since Kyle Rittenhouse killed two men and wounded a third on the streets of Kenosha, Wisconsin, a year ago, August, he is completely a free man. By now, you have heard that a Kenosha jury found Rittenhouse not guilty of every charge against him, one of which could have sent him to prison for life. So you can understand that reaction. Predictably, those who support Kyle's self-defense argument are celebrating tonight. And predictably, those who don't are not. And our Brian Enton is watching it all unfold. He is live for us in Wisconsin. So set the stage for me there, because in New York, they are marching across the Brooklyn Bridge. It just seems like that's not the case where you are. Oh, not the case at all, Ashley. It has been very, very quiet. Even when the verdict was read uh, just after lunch this afternoon, there was only 30 or 40 protesters uh, outside in front of the courthouse, and then they sort of left rather quickly. Let me show you the scene tonight. I'm going to step out of the way for you real quick, Ashley. I will zoom in. This is the front of the Kenosha County Courthouse, and you can see maybe 20, 25 people out front now. They had a bullhorn a little while ago, uh, but, but very, very quiet for the most part. National Guard is on standby tonight. They are staged outside of Kenosha in case anything gets out of hand, but I uh, no indication at that point that that's going to happen. And any idea about Kyle Rittenhouse himself? Uh, there, there was much made about the fact that he wasn't from there, and as it turns out, he's got family there, he lived there, he worked there. Is he still there, or has he left? We do not know the answer to that question, but it was interesting after the verdict was read, he was sort of whisked away, even away from his family with a security team. And all his lawyer would tell us is that he was taken uh, to an undisclosed location. And what about those, you know, hundreds of National Guardsmen that we had expected would be, you know, circling the courthouse by today? Uh, did they ever show? Have you seen hide nor hair? They have not been in Kenosha. We know there are 500 of them on standby, staging somewhere outside of the city in case they're needed. The sheriff told us uh, he's hoping and expecting that things will be calm. But I'll tell you, when little uh, situations have come up, just between a little, a couple of protesters outside the courthouse, uh, the police have these teams that come in in these vans. They sort of arrive out of nowhere. SWAT teams get out of the van quickly, uh, you know, sort of address the situation. So it seems like they're ready to go if something comes up, even though we can't see the police right now. Uh, but again, so far, everything very, very calm. Brian Enton, it's good you're there. I think it's because you're there. Uh, thank you so much for your work this week. Do appreciate it, Brian Enton, joining us live on the ground in Kenosha. I want to now bring in uh, somebody who is a key piece of this entire story and has been since the beginning, even if you never saw her. Jury and trial consultant, Joellen Demetrius. Uh, she's worked on a lot of big cases like OJ, 
Scott Peterson, Rodney King, Reginald Denny, Kobe Bryant, uh, and her phone is ringing off the hook, as you can as you can hear. Joellen, it's good to see you again. Um, you know, you and I meet every so often on these big cases, and I can tell your phone's been blowing up all day. First and foremost, yeah. congratulations. This is your team. You were on the defense team. You helped pick all those jurors as a consultant. Were you surprised by that verdict today? No, I, I wasn't surprised because what everybody seems to forget is that in any defense case, criminal defense, uh, there is this legal tenant call beyond a reasonable doubt. Sitting in that courtroom for a little over two weeks and listening to the prosecution's case and how each one of the prosecu uh, prosecution witnesses really assisted um, in our case in chief. Uh, I just did not see, uh, number one, that they had met their burden of proof, and number two, reasonable doubt. And reasonable doubt is a very, very high bar. And I think once, if these jurors decide to talk, we're going to hear about that. We're going to hear about the fact that they went through and actually asked for separate copies of each one of the jury instructions so they could understand it. This was a very analytical group. They took their time, and I think they came back with a just verdict based on the information they were presented. Joellen, it's it's almost impossible to even hear what you're saying because I know that the, the media has been banging down your door all day and they are continuing to try to Skype you even as you're live on the air. Can you see these? Can you see the setting that can turn them off? The people yeah, who are I, I trying did. to, uh, uh, they're Zoom bombing us. <laughs> I, I do want to ask you this really important question. And if, if that happens again, I'm going to let you pause it and turn it off. Um, there was so much to be made about the time that uh, Kyle Rittenhouse decided to, to take the stand. You read people. You write books about reading people. You met Kyle Rittenhouse. You, I would assume, would have had a lot to say about the decision as to whether to put the young man you met prior to the time that we all saw him uh, on the stand. Were you instrumental in making that decision to put him out there? I was simply a supplemental to the good trial experience of Mark Richards and Corey Chiriofsky. Um And, uh, you know, in any self-defense case, I think it's hard pressed for a defense team not to put uh, their client on the stand. So I simply uh, agreed with their good trial experience that that was the right thing to do. I mean, Kyle had to explain what he went through that day that led him to the actions that ultimately this jury was considering. Joe Ellen, we were all very surprised to see the process in Kenosha, Wisconsin, uh, to um, you know pick the alternates, and it was like a bingo drum. And Kyle himself pulled those names and numbers. Go ahead, and you can hit it off. So we want to hear you clearly. Thank you. <laughs> but we were um, we were also surprised to hear Mark Richards say earlier today that Kyle picked jurors that would have been very helpful to his case and that, you know, Mark was crestfallen by the jurors that came out of the deliberative body. Were you as upset about it? I was surprised uh, about the process, what we were not allowed to do. We weren't allowed a juror questionnaire. Um, the uh, restrictions to the attorneys, they were each allow allowed one hour for a voir dire. Um, the only thing we knew about these jurors, which is uh, which occurs in Wisconsin, is we knew their names, we knew their area of residence, we knew their age, and we knew their occupation. And that was it. The judge also did not allow certain questions dealing with politics, dealing with um, any sort of membership or contribution to anything from the militia to BLM to Antifa. Um, and he allowed very few questions about uh, about gun ownership. It was more along the lines of familiarity with guns. So we were very restricted compared to other cases in what we did uh, ultimately learn about each one of these jurors. And I, I'm so appreciative that actually, you can squeeze in this time. You have to run. Yeah, I know I could hear I the do. ringing constantly, but I do appreciate you giving us this time. Joellen, I'll see you on the next big one. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you so much.
All right, so Joe Ellen uh, and I just talked about someone named Mark Richards uh, a fair bit. And if you've been following this case, you've been watching that attorney do some pretty swift work in that courtroom. Excellent work, I might add, uh, which is why I am completely delighted that he is now live with me. Uh, Mr. Richards, thank you for squeezing uh, us into uh, your busy evening. I, I hope that your phone isn't blowing up like Joe Ellen's is, but I suspect that it is. I'd like to just ask you right off the bat, uh, first of all, congratulations on your um, verdict. That's got to have... That's it's got to have been a good day for you. Were you surprised? I don't want to say surprised, but after they were out as long as they were, um, we were definitely scared. Um, we were afraid there might be a compromise. Um, we felt as though we had the facts on our side and the law, um, and we put forth a good defense, and we were hopeful. But if anybody says we knew what was going to happen, they're full of it. Well, Counselor, that leads to my next question, um, and it's a two-part. Did Kyle think that he was going to prison, and did you prep him for that very real possibility? I'll take the second one first. We did prep him. We told him one way or the other he was going out that door today um, with a deputy to either come home with us or go to prison for a very long time. And... He hugged his family goodbye, his sisters. It was very emotional. Um, he threw up before we walked downstairs to get the verdict. Um, you know, there's, you haven't lived until you've been in that situation. I'm not suggesting I was in the situation he was in because no matter what happens to my clients, I get to go home at the end of the day. Um, but it was scary. It's, it's quite a description that you, um, that you just gave me, which leads me to wonder, what is he doing tonight? Where is he right now? He's home with his family, um, where he's been living for quite some time, uh, the last seven, eight months. And I think he's decompressing. Um, we've talked. He came into my office when security got here. And we talked a little bit, but not long, because we knew a lot of people would be showing up here. And he went home and... He's got the weight of the world lifted off his shoulders at this point. And regarding the security, um, you mentioned briefly this afternoon that you, when you signed on to this case, were surprised all of a sudden the death threats started coming in. That is not surprising. I watched trials now for 15 years, and I watched the Zimmerman case where, um, you know, litigants in that case also faced the same thing. Can you tell me the extent of the threats against you and also the threats against Kyle? You know, we've all had threats. The prosecutors had threats. Um, I have the police at my house. Um, you know, I quit answering my phone um, between the Kenosha County Courthouse and my office, which is only about a 17-minute drive. I had three death threats. Um, they're now calling my wife's phone. I answered it and somebody said, you know, stated my correct address and said, we're coming for you tonight. Um, I think most people who are going to try and kill me aren't going to call me, but it is unsettling. And to think people want to turn this into some sort of sick game, I, I have a real problem with. Could you um, elaborate a little bit on what you said earlier? And that was that uh, you had a question from, I think, um, someone in the press about the, the tears that, that Kyle shed on the stand. There's been much ado about that. One side says crocodile tears. The other side said it showed the, the real young man. Um, but you mentioned that he's been in counseling, that he has uh, suffered from PTSD and that he is unable to sleep at night. He seemed to have an, a sort of an affect on the stand. Can you dig in a little bit more about the person who Kyle is? Well, you know, it's, he, the peep, you know, there's two sides to that, real or fake. One side's right and one side's wrong. And I've known Kyle Rittenhouse <laughs> for over a year. Um, I've seen him in my office and I've seen in preparation for this trial, talking to him and him getting emotional and upset. Um, there were certain topics we really didn't talk about because we knew what was going to happen. Um, you know, the people who tweeted out the stupid things that it was fake. If you've ever seen a panic attack, that was one. And I'm sure they're the same people who are going to say that he was faking it when he 
just about passed out when the first not guilty was read. Um, I'm not going to change their minds. I know what happened. I know that kid, young man, and it was real. And he was genuinely troubled by the things that happened and it stayed with him. You know, I'm an insomniac probably cause I'm old. Um, but him and I talked much about how little sleep we get. And, you know, when I was his age, I didn't have any problems sleeping. Uh, Counselor, can, can you tell me about uh, post-trial? Uh, the, the, the cameras turn off. Uh, we don't get the inside view of what, what happens after uh, the gavel comes down and the, and the judge clears the courtroom. But I know so often that um, litigators like you really hope to have a word with the jury just to know what they were thinking. It, it informs you for your, your career, for your cases that, that are still to come. Did you get that opportunity to talk to this jury? And if so, what'd they say? Did not even attempt to. Um... I would love to talk to one or two of those jurors eventually. They're probably just as stressed out as I am right now. Um, we made, I don't want to say an agreement, but law enforcement was very um, helpful in security with myself and my clients and my co-counsel, Corey Shirafasi, um, getting in and out of the courthouse. You know, they asked that I not stick around because of the problems that might have happened. And I was more than willing to honor that request. You know, they took court, um, Kyle out the back door. We walked out and immediately went down to the secure tunnel and they took us out, um, you know, and we got home and made sure nobody was following us. Um, our security guards have been unbelievable. And, you know, I, I wish I had one tonight as opposed to they're all with Kyle, but I'll deal with that. Even though you've had a death threat, uh, somebody who, who quoted your address and said, tonight, we're coming for you tonight. Well, that's, you know, why the police, I suspect, are there. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm going to play a little inside baseball here. Uh, clearly, I you know would love to have the first interview with, with your client, Kyle. I've done legal journalism for 15 years. Here I am selling myself to you. But I've heard that he has secured an interview with Tucker Carlson on Fox News. And the only reason I bring that up is because in this world of polarized media now, it is well known that Fox has been very supportive of Kyle, the MSNBCs and CNNs of the world, maybe not so much. Do you think it's a wise decision to uh, to take that interview with, with Tucker Carlson um, at this time? I, you know, if it was up to me, that may not have happened, um, but it's not up to me. And, you know, the only thing I told Kyle is he has to be responsible for himself and he has to start making some of his own choices. And the most important word he can learn is no. Um, I, I do, I under, you know, MSNBC was so unfair to us. Um, obviously Fox has backed us, you know, and many of the Fox viewers have paid, um, money to help Kyle's defense. So there is a certain allegiance there, I believe. Um, I, I wish it wasn't so politicized, um, because, you know, we won today, but that doesn't really mean, you know, like in a sports metaphor, we came out, he's free, he can go about his life. But this this case has taken a dramatic toll on him, his family, and all the people who have unfortunately been drawn into it. Which leads me to this next question um, again, and it sort of has to do with the inside baseball, but on Fox News tonight, they're, they're talking about suing and that Kyle should sue every media outlet that called him a murderer and that said he was a white supremacist and that said he was guilty. And, you know, that's part and parcel of these cases that, you know, the, the, the information f flows like, you know, a waterfall. But Nick Sandman, um, he has come out publicly with a column saying that, Kyle should. Kyle should sue all the media outlets that disparaged him and perhaps in some estimation may have even risen to the level of defamation. Have you spoken with Kyle about that and would you advise him one way or the other with regard to that kind of civil action in the future? I, I am not a civil lawyer. I am a criminal lawyer. So I do not advise on topics like that. 
I can say this, that when I got involved in this case, um, and there were a couple of other prominent lawyers who were involved and in trying to make some calls. And, you know, I said, look, all of your, you know, riches and civil lawsuits are going nowhere if this kid gets found guilty of anything. So let's worry about what's important. Um, and ultimately, no actions were filed by Kyle or on behalf of Kyle while I was representing him. And I can say this, um, much of the coverage at the beginning was wrong. The trial proved that. But just in the last two weeks, you know, people might not believe this, but I watch MSNBC, CNN. I'm not a big Fox guy. And, you know, when I hear Joe Scarborough saying that my client shot his gun 60 times, that's wrong. When I hear some, you know, guest host on the Joy Reid say that my client drove four hours to go to a riot with his AR, that's wrong. It's false. And it makes me angry that they can't take the time to at least get the generic basic facts correct. And because it didn't fit in the story that they wanted to tell. And well, I'll you know, be on the record here, uh, Mark Richards, that uh, you should now put a new network on your uh, TiVo, and that's News Nation. We're pretty, um, we're pretty committed to not pulling the the bias stuff. And um, you know, 15, 20, I don't know, give or take uh, years in in covering legal news, I think those things are important. And so, uh, for that reason, I'm going to ask you to ask your client to to do an interview with me as soon as he's finished with that first one that he said he'd do. I think you would be well served to do a non biased interview with um, with your client. Um, there are a lot of people who probably should see the sides of Kyle that they maybe don't know. You know, that's just my yeah. pitch. And, One and last I'd question. Just like to, yeah, I'd ahead. like to thank my team, you know, and, you know, the reason I came on here is Joe Allen told me I had to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, but Joe Allen and I go back with, a long way. So. <laughs> Corey, I'm glad um, she was able to persuade you. <laughs> she said I had to. And, you know, she meant a lot to the team. She really helped with Kyle's family. My co-counsel, Corey Shirafasi, and when I say co, I mean that he was an equal. Um, and the investigators, you know, Todd and Steve, who worked on the case, a lot of effort went into this case, the experts, and there was no one person was more important than the other, and I think that's the key to this case. Well, you all really pulled it off. I do have this last question for you. And it, it comes to me when I listened to you earlier today when you mentioned um, you, you had a comment that I thought really stood out. And it said you said, I personally don't like people carrying AR-15s around. So I want to craft this question as gently um, and as respectfully as possible. There is the law in Wisconsin that this jury decided your client was within the law. He uh, perceived to, to have his life threatened and he reacted uh, in self-defense. That's the law. Not every state has that. Uh, many don't have the non-duty to retreat. Lots of states are quite different. And then there is the whole notion that two men are dead uh, because one had a plastic bag and then the other one had a skateboard. And so then there is the overall morality of it, which gets people out into the street. Do you know what I mean? Like that's what people feel about the whole notion is that two it men are dead. You know, he, he had threatened to kill him. He had threatened to harm others. He directly threatened to kill Kyle. He said, if I get you alone, I will effing kill you. That wasn't just Kyle saying that. That was another individual. And when he saw Kyle alone, they set up an ambush and he went after him. And when Kyle said, friendly, friendly, he yelled, and this is on tape, you ain't going to do S mother effort. And you know, it wasn't the bag. Kyle retreated. He ran from Joseph Rosenbaum. Rosenbaum continued to chase him. And, you know, I've said throughout this, why was Joseph Rosenbaum chasing him? He was going to do grievous harm, if not kill Kyle. The tape showing right there, I see it. And, you know, Kyle was put in a bad position by some bad people. And this is the result a jury trial 15 months later. Well, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to, you know, talk through a lot of these elements um, with me. And I reiterate the, um, the request to, to be able to talk to your client as well. I hope you'll be able to ask him uh, on our behalf if I can interview him next week. Sounds good. Mark Richards, thank you. Be well. Have a good night. Thank you. 
Uh, when we come back, you know, uh, what a perfect night. Usually Friday night is policing in America. Tonight is Friday night, policing in America. Who is this? Well, I think I this one. Oh, with you now. South 22nd Street the other day? Yeah. I had a talking about some stuff. Well, talk to me. I've got to hold on. Kyle. Back no. up. Back no, up. no, 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 no. Friday night, that means it is time to check in on policing in America, and we've got a dedicated and talented team of cops with us to break down some riveting videos, some of them pretty tough to watch. Tonight, we are doing it with retired NYPD detective Bill Cannon, who's host of Police Off the Cuff. That's a podcast. Also with us, former NYPD detective Tom Ruskin and retired Louisiana homicide detective Rodney Demery, host of the Murder Chose Me podcast. Gentlemen, welcome. Let's just dig right in, shall we? I want to take you to Atlanta, Georgia, where two police officers needed to hear only the following four words before some really heroic bravery unfolded. And those words are, he's still in there. So we'll go to the video. You're going to see the call came in about a man who had driven into two homes before uh, crashing his car into a tree. The car burst into flames. He is stuck inside, really out of it, too. Uh, this one's a real nail biter. I just want you to watch what these two officers did and then ask yourself if you would have done the same thing. Take a peek. The 1506 half fire stepped up. He's still in there. Get him out. Hey, open up. Right there. Do it, do it, do it, do it. Do it. You got it. Come on. You're fire scene. Hey, sorry. Hey. Come on, come on. Uh, you're getting burnt. Come on. Uh. So, Bill Cannon, I'm going to bring you in as we continue to watch this. So, we're just going to keep the video running because it takes over two minutes to get him out of there as the front of the car is burning. I, I can't imagine what goes to an officer's mind when he sees there's no handle left on the door, probably from one of the crashes, and that car could blow at any time. Walk me through it. Well, you know, police officers do hero heroic things all over the nation every single day, and these officers are no exception. And they had to react very quickly to a life and death situation, and they realized they couldn't open the door so they broke the window and they pulled them out through the window. I mean, that's, that's an amazing thing. And look, they were risking their own lives because at any minute that car could blow up and uh, cause uh, death or serious phys physical injury to them also. So as I said, cops do this all over the country and they put their own lives in danger for strangers, to save the lives of strangers. And it's really an incredible thing to watch. So, Tom Ruskin, uh, this driver apparently just suffered minor injuries despite all of this, right? It took, like I said, took about two minutes to finally get him physically out. It was that difficult. Um, door handles missing. Is there training for this, or is it all just whatever comes naturally? Well, they do train you for how to rescue someone from a car, and there is additional training, plus your field experience trains you what to do. But I will say that, to Bill's point, Cops do this every single day around the country. And until we had body cams, we never saw their heroic acts. We now have a chance to see what these cops are doing and basically take the other side of some of the bad stories that do come out about cops. And there he was. He got out and he is alive. That's just an incredible uh, story. All right, quickly to Kalamazoo, Michigan right now. Deputies on a call at a gas station. They notice a man with a boat on a trailer. Man they'd actually been looking for for a couple of days. His name is Kyle Goydesik. Uh He previously fled from police on another stop. But I want you to watch what the suspect does as the police approach him. And keep your eyes on his hands. Can you hang on one second? I just need Yep, I'll get you one second. What's up? What's going on tonight? What's going on, man? I was down at 22nd Street, South Who's 22nd this? Street. Well, I thought you guys were this one. Or with you now. South 22nd Street the other day? Yeah. I had a talk to you about some stuff. Well, no, leave okay, this to on. playful. Kyle, back no. up. Back no, up. no, 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 no,
it. Drop 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 it. Four, six, six, seven. We got mail and a gun. Our suspect from South County, Black Econo Line, Colorado, plate pulling a trailer. Okay, we are only partway through this story because now the chase is on after the break. We are going to show you what happened in that chase. There is a real twist in this one. We're back right after this. All right, before the break, uh, we were just about to head on this high-speed chase, and here you go. Th these are the officers chasing after that guy who has the boat on a trailer who, you know, just grabbed a gun out of his belt and scrambled everybody. So this is the weird part. As they're all going after him, several cruisers, this suspect grabs his own gun and shoots out of the truck that he's in, and he actually hits Officer Ryan Proxmire, killing him. In his cruiser. The other officers just think Proxmire's cruiser is disabled, so they keep going, and then there's a full on gunfight with this suspect. Have a listen. All right, I got you. I got eyes. Show me your hands! Show me your hands! Show me your hands! He's on the ground. So here's how this ended, and I suppose there wouldn't be a lot of love lost for this guy. Um, Rodney Demery, he was shot dead, but uh, that officer uh, was dead, and his... Other officers didn't even know it. In the interim, um, it's now uh, come to our attention that that Officer Ryan um, Proxmire has been posthumously uh, promoted to, to sergeant, the least I suppose we could all do. But oh my Lord, it is just astounding to see how quickly it can go absolutely sideways and how random that death is. What are the odds? Yeah, you know, um, when, I, when I first came into police and I had an older officer tell me that police work was 99% routine work and 1% sheer terror and chaos. And I think that kind of describes that, that type of work. Um, things go south really quick, you know, whether you're saving somebody in a fire or somebody's firing at you um, and, or someone's killed. It's, it's, uh, it's almost insane to me to think that people think we can live in a world without police. It's just, uh, you know, you're right, with, with certainly when you see something like that, right? All right, I'm going to switch gears here and um, want to talk about another story. Every day, police are heroic in the line of duty, but there are also those cases where it's questionable. And I want to turn now to an officer-involved shooting in Tustin, California. It's raising some questions. Officers were responding to a call saying a neighbor had seen a homeless man living in these uh, really thick bushes just off of a mobile home park two days prior. And that the neighbor said uh, he has a big, huge steak knife. That's what the report came in as. So the officers arrived, and then the battle was on to get this guy to come out of these really thick bushes. So I'm going to play the tape but I do want to warn my viewers here that some people might find this very disturbing. Hey, wake up. Come out with your hands up. Okay. I know you. Come on. Up? Let's go. Come on. Get out. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Let's go. Por acá. Let's go. Keep your hands up. Let's go. Come on. No. Get out. Can you go on the other side? Let's go. Get out. Enseñame tus manos ahorita. Keep your hands up. Deja de jugar con tus bolsas. Let's go. Come on. Let's go. Let's go. Come on. Step out. Come on. Hands up. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go now. Let's go. Out. Get 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 out.
Não dá pra ver. Esgara stick, esgara stick. Por que não dá pra ver? Que carrinha de Dale, dale, pega ver. Ah! Ai, 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 ai. So that's upsetting. Um, I am going to let you know that the man, Luis uh, Manuel Garcia, died that night. And so I want to start with you, and I'm going to do a real quick round robin for all three of you on this one. Bill Cannon, it seemed odd. He came out with a, a big stick, and the guy even said he's got a stick, but he was shot. Do, do you make sense of that one? You know, I think it escalated really quickly, and uh, I think they maybe could have done a better job of talking him out of there without maybe escalating it to the use of deadly physical force. He, she tasered him, and then he was running away. So at that point, I don't see the, um, the, necess the necessity for deadly physical force after that. Yeah, the, so the partner tased, um, and then you can see right there, we slowed it down. He's tased first, then he's shot, and, uh, and continues to run, but only a few, a few steps. So real quick, Thomas Ruskin, you know, they approached uh, the bushes with guns drawn. Is that because of the report of the big, huge steak knife? Because it seemed like it's a homeless man sleeping. Would you need to have your guns drawn at that point so early? You might, you might pull out your gun. I don't know if you'd aim it at him, but you might pull it out so you have it ready in case he comes launching out of the bushes with this with the knife uh, ready to hurt you. I agree with Bill. I think that there are mitigating circumstances that could have allowed other units to respond in New York City. We have emergency service who could come with different types of tools to potentially mm. take him out of the bushes uh, more carefully. Okay, so Rodney, I want you to jump in on this as well. Officer Estela Silva, uh, she's still out on the beat, um, working in the field. Does that surprise you? Yeah, that does surprise me because I agree with the other officers. Um, you know, it's kind of questionable the, the use of force. Um, I, I, I suspect that they're giving her the benefit of the doubt and, and having a uh, proper thorough investigation. Well, I can't thank the three of you enough. Uh, it was a little shorter version um, of Policing in America tonight because we did have that Kyle Rittenhouse verdict and, uh, you know, those two amazing guests that we talked to off the top of the show as well. But we hope you'll come back again. Bill, Tom, Rodney, thank you, all three of you. So we've got a big week next week. Closing arguments expected on Monday in the Arbery case in Georgia. Uh, so make sure you tune in for that. And then Chasing Gillen is a docuseries. Gillen Maxwell, who is now on trial. Jury selection's already begun. And so there's a docuseries, and the writer of it is going to join us. And guess who's going to anchor for me as I take a little break? The one and only Brian Anton, my friends. This man, who I adore, is going to be your host here on Banfield all next week. So I encourage you, jump on in and uh, check out Brian. He's going to do the heavy lifting for me. In the meantime, I want you to have a wonderful weekend. Tweet me at TV Ashley, Facebook and Insta is Ashley Banfield. And I will see you again after Thanksgiving. Have a good one, everyone. Thank you for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact driven unbiased coverage.